It permeates all of our major institutions. Uh, and the work of undoing racism requires policy change. Tonight, an external review finds systemic racism within the Canadian Human Rights Museum. We're also asking for tents to be recognized as people's dwellings and their properties. Organizers of a tent city in Edmonton say they aren't going anywhere until their demands are met. Instead of maybe they have one day in school and one day virtual, we're looking at other spaces in the communities where the students can go. And how some nations are planning to bring kids back to school. Good evening and welcome to APT National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We begin in Winnipeg where a new report examining allegations of systemic racism and other forms of oppression at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights was released today. The report follows several accounts from former and current employees claiming the museum failed to protect them from racism, homophobia and other forms of, of discrimination. Brittany Hobson has more. As board chair, I apologize to anyone who has been offended by the practices of the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. A scathing review into the workplace culture at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights has determined racism is pervasive and systemic within the institution. Interim CEO Pauline Rafferty accepts the report's findings. It's saddening, it's troubling, it's upsetting. Uh, but I really believe that it has also identified the issues and gives us a huge opportunity now in a transparent way to make the changes that we need to make. In June, several former and current employees took to social media with allegations of racism, sexism and homophobia. An Instagram account called CMHR Stop Lying was created after the museum made a post supporting the Black Lives Movement. The museum called for an external review shortly after. Laurel Harris, a Winnipeg lawyer, was in charge of it. There are folks who've had some difficult experiences. Harris interviewed 25 current and former employees. The report found black, indigenous and people of color were often passed over for promotion in favor of white candidates, as well as complaints of racism from BIPOC employees were often overlooked. Systemic racism is a real thing in Canada. It permeates all of our major institutions. Uh, and the work of undoing racism requires policy change. It requires changes in practice, but it also requires introspection on the part of individual Canadians. The museum also admitted exhibits containing LGBTQ content seven times from 2015 to 2017 at the request of some religious schools. The new report outlines 44 recommendations to address the findings. Prior to the report's release, the museum's board of trustees created a new diversity and inclusion committee. They are working to implement some of the recommendations immediately. We need to make and do the hard work to make sure that our policies, our practices, our processes, all of those hiring practices are looked at, reviewed, and that we make the changes necessary to bring in a diverse workforce. Rafferty says the museum has allocated $250,000 to put toward anti-racism, sexual harassment and cultural training. I believe together we can make the changes necessary and I think with that change I'm hoping the public will give us a chance. A second phase of the review will be released at a later date. Brittany Hobson, ABTN National News, Winnipeg. Today in Montreal a warning call was put forward from those closest to the people that will suffer if social programs are cut. Montreal social community groups and unions want to make sure society's most marginalized are not forgotten. Leaders of Montreal social groups and the Postal Union held a press conference to raise concerns about potential austerity measures post-COVID-19. With record spending deficits, many in the area fear that the way back to a healthy economy will come on the backs of the homeless and poor. According to this collective, austerity means cutting social programs, but they want more investment in the services they offer. I appreciate that the City of Montreal has put in some measures for the homeless, but it is a fraction of the population that is able to receive them. And now that we are, um, you know, deconfinement mode and opening the doors, the services specifically for the homeless population are getting minimized. And I am very much hoping that uh, they will consider new services, that they will find monies to help. 
There's more trouble this evening near a residential housing development next to Six Nations Mohawk Territory. Ontario Provincial Police have arrested several people for occupying the site despite a court order. The group has been occupying the Mackenzie Meadows residential development site, putting a stop to construction. OPP say a court injunction was presented on Friday, but several people remained on site. The OPP moved in on the site today and made several arrests. A spokesperson for Haldeman County says Foxgate Developments bought the land in 2015 and in 2019 reached an agreement with the Six Nations Indian Act Band Council. The Indian Act Council supports Foxgate Developments but not the people occupying the construction site. Last word is that the provincial police have closed a major intersection near the construction site after some tires were set on fire. And the tent city, which was set up in Edmonton's downtown last month with just a few tents, has now turned into a large community. And organizers who set up the site say they are not moving until their demands are met. Chris Stewart reports. Camp Pikawiwin near Remax Field in downtown Edmonton started as a group of 10 tents on July 24th. It's now grown to 170. This man, Uncle who calls himself Jared. Uncle Jerry, has been we'll staying here the past we'll several days. He says the camp has become a community. I took in somebody last night before that rainstorm came up and I said, you got to get in here. Come stay here. This morning, he got his paychecks. Hello. He took me in and he goes, we're going for a steak dinner tonight. That's our supper. Camp Pikiwiwin was started as a place for the homeless to gather after the city recently closed temporary shelters. Peter Kane is the president of the Edmonton chapter of the Crazy Indians Brotherhood. The Brotherhood helped assemble tents and provide security. It's basically in uh, solidarity to uh, police violence against the homeless. I mean, there's been a lot of comments and concerns about that, so it's something we're here just to support, to bring, you know, bring attention to. So people can be less Deanna Kakaji is a community and organizer and helped start Camp Pikawiwin. She and other organizers gave a list of demands to the city. Firstly, we're asking for the divestment of $39 million from the police budget. We're also asking for tents to be recognized as people's dwellings and their properties, um, giving people rights to what they have as their only home. Um, we've also asked for the free transit. The organizers and the city have agreed to not increase the size of the camp. In a statement, the city says they are working with organizers to provide services to homeless people and have begun talks. They also stated they will be ready to act if there is any violence. But Deanna Kakaji says the camp has been well behaved. It's been very peaceful. The community has all taken a part here in growing um, Pickawaywin camp. Everyone's been chipping in. Peter Kane says there is no end date. Stay here as long as it takes. <laughs> I mean, until the support runs out. I mean, uh, there's no set date to shut down or, or some demands are met. Chris Stewart, APTN National News. Edmonton. Tomorrow is the final day for Indigenous patients to submit their experiences for the inquiry into racism in BC's health care system. Last month, the province started an investigation into systemic racism in health care after allegations of doctors and nurses playing a racist game surfaced. The game involved guessing the blood alcohol levels of Indigenous patients in the emergency room. Former child care advocate Mary Ellen Chupel Lafond is leading the investigation. The survey is on the Government of BC's website, and the deadline is tomorrow, August 6th. It's time for a quick break, but still to come, a look at how provinces differ in back-to-school plans and what it means for Indigenous communities. Starting in the east, 26 degrees in Charlottetown and 27 under Mixed Sun and Cloud in Fredericton. 17 in Nain and 24 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. 23 in Quebec City and 25 in a mix of sun and cloud in Montreal. 25 degrees in Toronto and 25 in Sarnia. 
25 degrees in Timmins and 27 in a mix of sun and cloud in Thunder Bay. 31 in sun in Norway House and 31 in sun in The Paw. 30 degrees in sun in Winnipeg and 30 in sun in Brandon. 34 in a mix of sun and cloud in Swift Current and 32 in Saskatoon. 31 in La Ronge and 27 in Stony Rapids. Welcome back. Kids across the country are preparing to go back to school and provinces have begun to release back to school plans. The plans vary between full-time classes, online schooling and hybrid approaches. Jamie Pashagumskum takes a look at just what the school year is going to look like in Indigenous communities. Ontario Premier Doug Ford wants kids back to school full-time. Nick Shaver is the Director of Education for the Mattawa Nations in Ontario. Each of the nine communities are developing individual back-to-school plans. The Mattawa Nation has asked for $25 million in support. If, if fully funded, it would be prepared for most eventualities that may come up. So if we have to go to an online uh, learning environment, it would, it would address those. If we had to go to a hybrid model, it would address those. And then if students were fully back in the school, it would address those concerns as well. Kimberly Quinn is Director of School Operations of the Cree School Board in Quebec. She says the Cree Nation has no cases of COVID-19 kids will be returning to, but they are looking at other options should situations change. So instead of maybe they have one day in school and one day virtual, we're looking at other spaces in the communities where the students can go um, and working with, let's say, with the cultural department and the Cree culture teachers and, again, in a safe way. Quinn said masks will not be mandatory and unless cases of COVID-19 appear in communities, students will be in school full time with classes of no more than 15 students. And keeping the group stable. That was the main aspect that our public health authority told us was to keep our students in the same room as much as possible and only have the teacher changing. While the Cree Nation will be returning to school this month, Mattawa schools are most likely looking to reopen in September. But a lot of teachers left when the pandemic hit. Some schools teachers did return uh, several months later or a month or so later um, to, to kind of wrap things up. But, uh, but most of the teacher and staff that was not from the community uh, did leave to go back to where they came from and uh, didn't return to the community. The Cree School Board's plan has three scenarios depending on the level of risk to COVID-19, ranging from a full back to school plan to online learning in the case of an outbreak. In most cases, exactly what the school year will look like this year depends a lot on the possibilities of outbreaks or a second wave. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. A Mi'kmaq-run nonprofit uses 3D printing technology to make medical supplies for healthcare workers. In this encore story, our reporter Angel Moore gives us the details on how they're made. These 3D printers are normally in classrooms across Nova Scotia, but now they are here in Halifax, printing personal protective equipment that may be in short supply for isolated communities fighting COVID-19. Philippa Picto is working with community health directors to make sure they have enough supplies. But also to be prepared for if there is a case in one of our communities that we have everything in place to be able to minimize the impact as much as we can. The 3D printers are provided by Digital Mi'kmaq, a federally funded program of All New Egg, which is a nonprofit organization that helps Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs get their ideas off the ground. Digital Mi'kmaq promotes science and technology education for Indigenous students. Educational facilitator Sonia Jane is preparing the shields. And these are the bands which are printed using the 3D printers and this punch thing is attached here and here you go. Supplies will be shipped out to health centers and communities across Atlantic Canada. Each box contains gloves, 25 face shields and 25 face masks. Chris Gugu is the chief operating officer of All New Egg. He said the printers can make just about anything. We, so we uh, basically uh, created a, a few prototypes uh, and made sure that we were able to produce these with our printers. And from then on, basically, we said, okay, we, we can do it. 
Gugu obtained a license from Health Canada to produce, purchase, and distribute the protective equipment. There are 25 printers that can make about 1,000 face shields per week. Holly Griffiths makes sure the printers keep operating. As long as it takes, you know, one, one, one more person that doesn't get sick or one day closer that people can go back to work and support their families, like, as long as it takes and for, for how much we can do, you know. They will keep providing personal protective equipment to health centres as long as needed. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, Halifax. From the East Coast to the Prairie Provinces, a Saskatchewan lawyer who was also a seamstress formed a group called the Mask Makers, sewing thousands of face masks for the provinces far north. Priscilla Wolf has the details in this story we originally aired in May. Angela Bishop, who is Métis from Green Lake, Saskatchewan, has been a federal lawyer for 25 years and is still working full time. After her 9 to 5 job, she sews face masks with 15 other women. The seamstresses provide much needed face masks to the far north. After doing it for a couple of weeks, uh, friends and family started to join on and so I've been coordinating mask making efforts uh, for um, masks, um, homemade face masks to go to northern Saskatchewan and we've actually sent over a thousand face, face masks into uh, northwest Saskatchewan. The homemade face masks are not medical masks but they use polypropylene, the same material in medical masks. Bishop says the dedicated group she works with make the masks as volunteers and don't accept money only donations of fabric. We identify which fabric stores we purchase from or in some cases um, you know they'll do purchases for us for uh, like elastic is it's unbelievably difficult to to get our hands on so they'll they might do a, like an Amazon purchase for us so so we do get support from the community and others but um, not through anybody sending us any money the goal is to send masks to all the far north we're trying to hit uh, every community but um, you know, I, I think that we know where the hot spots are. I mean, it's, you know, we know that 70% of all cases in Saskatchewan are in the far north. They sent over 100 face masks to the Navajo Nation to try help them. And they sent over 3,000 face masks to Saskatchewan's far north. Bishop adds, all the masks have themes. When we when we created them, that um, people would take pride in wearing them and that they'd want to wear them. So uh, we did a number of Métis theme ones. I think you can kind of see some of the masks in in the background there. Um, we did some Métis theme ones. We did some construction theme ones, and so we've been having just a lot of fun. They also wanted to make sure that the elders have custom-made ones. Uh, we also did um, a little um, uh, year saver for elders and veterans. We've, uh, you know, thought about the fact that they're also wearing um, some of them um, hearing aids, and so it's difficult for a mask to fit on them properly. So we got these um, year savers uh, that actually say a wasuta in the back, which is um, Cree for like, you know, stay away. It's kind of like a, a gentle shooing away. So it's you know, uh, social distancing um, in, in Cree. Bishop adds her group of seamstresses are helping their communities one face mask at a time. We're trying to encourage people to wear um, face masks um, because the mask that you put on another individual's face is the mask that will uh, protect you. And, um, you know, an individual at risk is a family at risk is a community at risk, it is our nations at risk. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. For 40 years, the Good Fish Lake First Nation in Alberta has been operating one of the largest laundry and dry cleaning businesses in Canada. They recently added something new, COVID masks, and they're a big seller. Chris Stewart has more in this previously aired story. Tom Jackson is the CEO of the Goodfish Lake Business Corporation. Since 1978, the band-owned business has been offering laundry and dry cleaning to the oil sand sector. And business is very good. A fleet of trucks drive daily to Fort McMurray, picking up and dropping off garments for oil giants Syncrude and Suncor. 
1989, they started producing industrial coveralls for oil workers. With COVID, they began to make protective masks. So we made a bunch for our employees and for the elders of the community, and then made some more for the community as well. And from that, we kind of learned how quickly we could make them, all that type of thing. And we wound up with some fairly major orders for over 100,000 masks for the energy industry. And retail stores began making orders. And so we've had to add people and, uh, and uh, production capacity in the last little while to keep up with the mask orders, which is a very nice problem to have considering everything that's going on with this pandemic and how it's affecting businesses. Natalie Jackson is one of the seamstresses who was making coveralls, but now makes the masks. She says she can make 300 per day. It truly is an honor to, to be helping uh, not only our community, but other communities and also uh, the industries out there that we, we normally deal with, Syncrude and Suncor, a true honor. Natalie says even with the facility making 10,000 masks per week, they are still following safety protocols. We stay safe and we follow procedure. We, are, we practice procedure every day. We are reminded. And so we, we practice at home when we wear our masks, our protective equipment, everything necessary we need to stay safe throughout the day. They are still looking to hire more temporary workers until their masks are no longer needed. Chris Stewart, APTN National News. Edmonton. We have to take one more break, but still ahead, Mars and Canada might have more in common than you think. Over in the west, 29 in Sun and Fort Chippewa and 32 in Fort McMurray. 30 degrees in Sun and Red Deer and 34 in Medicine Hat. 23 in Kamloops and 17 in Quesnel. 16 degrees in a mix of sun and cloud in Smithers and 17 in Prince George. 14 in Rock River and 16 in Whitehorse. 23 in sun in Yellowknife and 19 in a mix of sun and cloud in Wrigley. 17 in Colville Lake and 17 in cloud in Fort McPherson. 21 in sun and cloud in Baker Lake and 9 in Repulse Bay. 8 degrees in sun in Arctic Bay and 7 in Clyde River. If you've ever thought some of your family members might be aliens, you may not be too far off. A new study suggests parts of Mars used to look like Canada. Researchers found that deep valleys under sheets of ice on Mars once mirrored the Canadian high Arctic. They say the Martian surface about three and a half billion years ago looked like the surface of Canada 20,000 years ago. I'm curious if Canadians can now start calling themselves Martians. That's been your look at APTN National News. As always, you can visit our website at aptnnews.ca for more Indigenous news. I'm Gerald Stranger. Have a great night.